pull the chat up. All right. Okay. Uh, my apologies for the uh, the slight delay. I, I don't know what happened with my, my technical setup. I'm sure everybody's going to be uh, experiencing that here and there throughout the semester with all this uh, move to online education, you know, such is the, the way of things. Um, but it's Friday. Let's go ahead and, uh, and get started. Uh, a couple of quick announcements. So your attendance grades are up to date as of today. And as of today, or after today, I'll, I'll update them for today. The reason why I'm going through all this is because on Monday, we're going to have an exam review, and then Wednesday, we have our exam. And we'll talk about specifically how the exam's going to be structured, uh, what you can expect on it. Uh, most likely, what I will do is it will be a timed exam on Blackboard. And uh, the, it'll be a timed test, but I'll, I, I'm a partial credit guy. So probably what I'll do is you'll have the test, and I'll give you an hour on the test, and then I'll have a separate um, submission form on Blackboard for you to upload your scratch work. And so probably what I'll do is the exam is going to be like from 1 to 2, and I'll open the submission form up from like 2 to 3. So you don't have to be like hurry and, oh, God, i got to scan it and get it in 2. Like I'll give you a little bit of time after the time limit to scan it in uh, and whatnot. Um, Mon the point, though, I want to make is Monday, uh, we are um, doing our exam review. So I want you to review your homework assignments, the notes, everything that we've done in class, and come prepared with questions, okay, uh, about what will be on the exam. The exam will cover homework, w homeworks one through two. And so I mean like 1.1, 1.2, 2.1, all the way to 2.7. Um, uh, I have here that homework six is to be graded. I think that uh, I think we got that graded today, and so I'll make sure the solution's posted uh, after this. And then on um, Monday, I'll have the uh, uh, solution to homework 2.7, so you'll have all of your uh, homework solutions. I am going to assign a homework today, but that's not going to be due until next Friday because I don't want you to have to worry about that uh, while you're preparing for the exam. Now, don't get me wrong, you can turn it in early if you want, and it's not a very long assignment, it's pretty short, um, but I just wanted to make sure that you were you were clear on that. Everybody good? Okay, all right. Um, I'm going to go ahead and, and uh, preface this lecture by saying that this is going to be a very mathy lecture. In other words, it's, it's going to be very... Uh, um, algebra and, and proofy, if you will, that we're going to kind of do a proof during lecture today. Um, and I do this because, you know, I remember when I was in statics, I always, um, you know, going back to this stuff, I always remember I understood how to do the cross product and I understood the, the mechanics of it, but I always, I wanted to make sure that I understood um, why it worked, like why this pattern worked. Um, the next, it's right there on the slide. The next, the homework I'm assigning today is not due until next Friday. You can do it early if you want, but it'll, uh, it'll be due next Friday. Because you all turned in a homework today, and I don't want you to turn in any more homework between now and the exam. That's, that's the idea. Okay. Um, so let's, uh, let's jump into uh, the wonderful world of, of cross products. Um, I, I want to hopefully make sure that after today's lecture, you understand what a cross product is, what it's intended to do, and uh, how the, the formula works. Ultimately, I'll go ahead and tell you, we're going to have a very mathy lecture. It's going to be kind of proofy. Uh, but in the end, the method that we're going to derive is going to be very straightforward. Now, I'll go ahead and tell you, because I'm operating off my office machine, I'm going to have to do the problems on my whiteboard. Uh, but if I have time, I might upload um, them to the, the course notebook uh, in Teams. But I'll be hopping back and forth between my whiteboard uh, a fair amount. Okay, so what are we talking about here? Well, Chapter 2 was all about, uh, and, and everything that we've done up until now in statics uh, has been about basically adding vectors together. I mean, all uh, like our chapter two was statics of particles, and all that meant was all the forces were all meeting at a common point. And so when that happens, the, really, the only thing that you need to concern yourself with is taking vectors and adding them, okay? Well, what we're going to have to do very soon is we're going to have to discuss how to multiply two vectors, okay? 
Um, and uh, it, it's, it's very important because whenever you have forces, I'll go ahead and give you a little bit of a spoiler. Whenever you have forces that are not meeting at a current point, we end up having two uh, sets of equal equations we have to deal with. We have to uh, uh, ensure that the sum of forces uh, is equal to zero, but we also have to ensure there's this new concept that we're going to talk about called a moment. And we have to ensure that the sum of moments equals zero. And the way that you compute a moment uh, in vector land is through multiplying vectors together. Now, I should emphasize, or I should clear up right off the bat, is that there's actually two ways to multiply uh, vectors together. Uh, the specific terminology for that is either a scalar product or a vector product. And what I mean by that is um, if you have vector A and vector B and you'd like to multiply them together, um, you could generate a scalar answer like vector A times vector B is 6. Okay, And that's called a scalar product. In fact, um, uh, uh, you know, scalar product is the official term. Now, I'm going to tell you, very rarely will, um, will we call that a scalar product, and very rarely will mathematicians call that a scalar product. They call it a dot product because of the notation. You'll say A dot B. Uh, so you can multiply vector A and vector B and get a scalar, or you can multiply vector A and vector B and get another vector. Okay? And so we use dots for uh, scalar products. Um, hold on for a sec. Blackboard Collaborate is not working well on my phone today. It wasn't working well for me a second ago when I was um, uh, when I was trying to connect uh, uh, via my uh, my laptop. So you might need to um, uh, uh, connect via a, 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 a Surface machine or, or a, 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 a docked machine because uh, that was happening to me too. I don't know about anybody else. If anybody else is experiencing connectivity issues, uh, let me know. So a scalar product or a dot, uh, dot product yields a number, a scalar. Vector products yield another vector. And the notation that we use is the multiplication X sign. And so it's commonly referred to as a cross product. Uh, we start with cross products, and we'll probably use these a lot more throughout the semester. So uh, we want to start with uh, uh, dealing with these first. OK, so what is a cross product? OK, a cross product is a way of multiplying two vectors together such that you yield another vector. So the cross product of uh, A and B will be another vector. Okay, now there's a lot going on on this slide, so let me sort of break it down and simplify it for you. Okay, let's go back to square one. What is the difference between a scalar and a, a vector? A scalar contains only a magnitude, but a vector contains a magnitude and a direction, okay? So what I want to do is I want to talk about the cross product and I want to see, okay, if this cross product needs to have a magnitude and direction, what are those magnitude and directions? And what is a way that I can define that's both meaningful and unique to a given, uh, a given quantity, okay? Uh, so let's say you got two vectors, A and B. Okay, so let's talk about the magnitude and the direction. Maybe first off, let's talk about the magnitude, okay? So if I've got vector A and B, what magnitude could I generate that's meaningful? Well, you all know by now that you could take vectors and, and, and uh, connect them in a tip-to-tail fashion, like here's vector B, okay? And so you could stick, you know, you, know, you all know right now, by now that that uh, is vector A, uh, and then you can uh, sub this, you can put that as uh, vector B. I'm drawing this with my mouse, so I apologize for the handwriting there. So you all know that you can connect those uh, vectors in a tip-to-tail fashion. And it, uh, and so, you know, the order there doesn't, doesn't really matter. Um, so if I have two vectors, I think it stands to reason that I can define a region that those vectors enclose, this, this, uh, this parallelogram region here, okay? So if the cross product needs a magnitude and direction, I propose that I want the magnitude to be the area of this parallelogram. Oh, Lord, my handwriting is horrible. It's what happens when you draw it with a, with a mouse. Okay, so I propose that the magnitude uh, of the cross product, when it's all said and done, the magnitude needs to be the area of that parallelogram, okay? Now, how do you determine the area of the parallelogram? Well, this is just geometry, right? 
Okay, so I have A, uh, the magnitude of A, I have the magnitude of B, and so the area of this parallelogram is basically just A times this height right here. Now, what is that height? Well, if I know B and I know this angle, then you could determine that height using a little bit of trig, and it's just going to be B sine theta. Okay, so one of the indirect uh, applications of the cross product, I guess you could say, is that if you have two vectors out in space, like vector A and vector B, you can use the cross product to determine the angle between the two vectors, because you can say, I've got the cross product of A and B, I know the magnitude of each vector, I can solve for the sine of theta uh, pretty easily. All right, so that's, that's the case for its magnitude. What about its direction, okay? So I've got these two vectors out in space, and let's, um, you know, let, let's, let's go back, let's go to the camera here for a second, okay? So I've got these two vectors out here in space. Let's say these vectors are represented by my pen and this marker, okay? And so keep in mind, these two vectors, they can point anywhere, okay? So let's say they're pointing, I don't know, like this, like this vector A and this is vector B. Well, let's, let's think about this from a geometry perspective. I've got vector A and I've got vector B. Well, geometry tells me that if I have vector A and vector B, that I can define a plane that those two vectors occupy. You know, it's like, you know, two lines share a common plane. So let's say here's the plane, okay? So how can I define a magnitude that's unique, okay? If it occupies the plane, well, I could say the cross product has to be in the plane, but it could point anywhere. It could point this way, that way, that way, and it would still be in the plane. So how about instead of, um, how about instead of in the plane, how about perpendicular to the plane? Like here's vector A, here's vector B, and the cross product needs to be at a right angle. Well, there's really only one way that can point in that direction. So what we can then say is, hold on, going back to my share. So what we can say is that our cross product, the magnitude, the magnitude needs to be the area of that parallelogram, and the uh, direction needs to point perpendicular to that plane. And it's really only the, the only unique way that we can define that vector, uh, uh, that resultant vector. Okay. Now, those are the goals. Those are the general goals of the, uh, uh, the, the vector pro or the cross product. And we'll talk about how we derive the formula here in a bit. Okay. Now, um, like I said, the vector points uh, uh, in a direction perpendicular to the plane. Well, if you know anything about geometry, like let's take this image here on the slide. Um, here's, you know, vector one and vector two, like this vector P right here and this vector Q right there. Um, there's really two ways that that vector could point. It, for it to be perpendicular. It could either point up like it's shown here on the slide or it could point down. So we do need to pick one. And so the way that we pick one is we use what's called the right hand rule, okay? So the idea is, and here, here's how the right hand rule works, okay? Um, I'll, I'll go ahead and uh, stop my share here. I'm gonna bounce back and forth between the slides and the camera, so, so bear with me. Okay. So the way the right hand rule works is whenever you're taking a cross product, what you do is you take your right hand and you uh, point your fingers, so you keep your hand open, you point your fingers in the direction of the first vector, and then you curl your fingers in the direction of the second vector, so A cross B. And so A cross B, your thumb, is the direction of the uh, of the result. So like for example, for instance, if we're talking about our coordinate system, right? So here's the x-axis and here's the y-axis. X curled that way in three dimensions, that's the z-axis. So you can all use, also use the right-hand rule to make sure that you've labeled your axes right, like curl from x to y, and whichever way your thumb's pointing, that's the, uh, that's the z-axis. Now, it's because of this, like one of the things you can generate uh, from an understanding, like we haven't actually determined how to compute a pro cross product yet, but one of the things I can tell you is that just based off of this definition, the cross product is not 
commutative. And, and what that means is the order matters, right? Like it, th that's not the case with numbers. You know, two times three is the same thing as three times two, but that doesn't work with vectors. Like you can't take A cross B and it's the same thing as B cross A. In fact, if you take A cross B and B cross A and compare them, you'll find that they're negatives of one another. And just think about the right-hand rule. If you have A cross with B, points this way. But if you have B cross with A, I mean, think about how your hand has to do that. B cross with A, your thumb's pointing in the opposite direction. And that's just a, a geometrical representation that your cross product uh, uh, is, is negative if you, uh, if you switch your terms. And that's going to be kind of important uh, here in a second. Okay. All right. I'm going to stop the share here in a second, but actually I'm going to stop it right now. Okay. So let's take a look here at, at what I've got on the board because what I've got on the board has kind of simplified what's in the next few slides. And I, and I, wanna, I wanna build this with you and make sure that, the, uh, that this makes sense. Okay, so what's our goal? We wanna determine how to compute the cross product, okay? Now, what are our goals? Okay, our goals are that the magnitude of that vector is the magnitude of A times the magnitude of B times the side of 90 degrees. So you could say that this goal right here is for uh, the magnitude. And this one right here where it says A cross B is perpendicular to the plane fo uh, formed by A and B, and as long as that follows the right-hand rule, you could say that this is the direction. So that's our rule for the magnitude and that's our rule for the direction. Okay, now just to make sure everybody's with me, I'm gonna ask a question that might seem completely uh, out of left field. Remind me, what's the sine of 90 degrees? Just making sure everybody's paying attention. One. One, exactly right, thank you. One. All right, just keep that in the back of your head. Okay, all right. In order to understand what the cross product is and how to compute it for uh, an arbitrary set of vectors, I wanna look at cross products involving I and J and K, okay? And so the first question I wanna ask is, what is I cross with J? Like, what is that? Okay, so let's remember our goals, okay? The magnitude and the direction. Well, first thing I wanna do is let's just draw our I vector and our J vector. Let's draw those on here, okay? So let's see, this is our I vector. So that's the I vector right there in the X direction. And this is our J vector right here. Okay, so that's the J vector. All right, now let's go through these rules. All right, let's start off with the magnitude. Uh, this term here, A cross B is uh, uh, AB sine theta. Remember, the magnitude needs to be equal to the area of the parallelogram formed by these. So drawn in three dimensions, I'd say that looks something like this, okay? Now remind me, what is this angle right here? What is that angle between the X and the Y axis? It's 90 degrees. So maybe if I was looking at this from an X and Y axis standpoint, this is the X axis and this is the Y axis. This is my I vector. This is my J vector right here. This is my parallelogram, right? Now, let me just ask you a question. What is the area of that parallelogram? What is the area there? What is this area right here? I, J. Well, okay, yeah, but okay, you're right, I, J, but remember, uh, the area is a, a, the area is a scalar, right? And so it's the magnitude of I times the magnitude of J, and that area is going to be one, right? So he, here's what we know. I propose that the, uh, 
that the magnitude of I cross J is one. Okay. I propose that. Now, as for the direction of, of uh, I cross J, follows our right hand rule, right? So we take I, point our fingers towards I, curl them towards J, so curl them towards J, and our thumb points in the direction of I cross J. So I propose that this is I cross J. Now let me ask you a question. I have a vector pointing along the Z axis that has a magnitude of one. What is I cross J? What vector has a magnitude of one that points along the Z axis? K, exactly right. So that's our first cross product that we know just based off our definitions. No real like, like super formal equations, just recognizing that based off of these goals, I cross J has to equal K. Now, if ever, so that's, that's one of them. Okay, now let's see if you're paying attention. What is J crossed with I going to be? Is it negative K? Negative K, exactly right. For two reasons. One, I mean, we 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 identified earlier that for any vector, A cross B has got to equal negative B cross A. But even if that doesn't work, just follow the right hand rule, right? J cross with I. So take your hand like this, cross with I. It points in the opposite Z direction. So there's two cross products right there. Okay. So far, so good. Now, let's try, I mean, you can, you can follow the geometry for other, you know, iterations. Like, what happens if you get J crossed with K? And what about this one? Okay. So, just think about it, all right? This vector here, we've identified that vector as K. Okay. So, J crossed with K, so we're talking about that area right there, same deal, it's going to have a magnitude of one, and then J cross with K points in that direction, that's I. Make sense? And so, likewise, what happens if you flip these? K cross with J. It's negative I. Okay. Everybody with me so far? And so you could you could fill in the rest. You could say, okay, I see where this is going, Dr. Mike. K cross with I is going to be J, and I cross with K negative J. Okay, I'm having trouble understanding the right-hand rule in regards to J and K. Okay, so what we're doing here is, oh, God, the, the art is going to kill me. I'm going to do my best. All right. Oh, dropping my, my eraser. Okay, now, here's the y-axis. Here's the Z axis, okay? So first off, the, the, the first thing I would tell you is that if you're having a hard time understanding this, the best thing to do is almost like find a part uh, like in your room. Like here I am, I'm in my office, right? So I could say like, this is the uh, X axis, that's the Y axis, and that's the Z axis. So actually almost like walk up to each of these regions yourself, okay, you know, what's X, what's Y, and what's Z, and start using your hand to point this way. So what I'm saying is that I'm going to point my fingers towards the Y axis, curl them towards the Z axis, and so my thumb points towards the X axis. D does that make sense? I know that's kind of tough to draw sometimes. Yeah, so, yeah. so it's almost like this, like, if I say, how about this? Let's say that this is the x-axis, like, like, like this way, 
This is the x-axis. The y-axis is from the floor to the ceiling, and the z-axis is in and out of the camera. So y curled to z is x. Does that make sense? Good deal. Yes, it's a little, it takes a little getting used to, I will admit. Okay. Now, we've got these, so there's, so there's, you know, I've got three vectors and I got, you know, six different cross products. There's three more that are left over. What about the ones where it's I cross with I and J cross with J or K cross with K? Okay, well, here's the thing with these. Okay, so I'm going to erase this. I'm going to erase this. So let's just do it this way. This is the x-axis. This is the y-axis. So this is the i vector, and here's another i vector. Okay, so two I vectors stacked on top of one another. Well, remember, the magnitude of this vector needs to be equal to the area of the parallelogram formed by those. But the vectors are going in the same direction. There is no area formed by that parallelogram. So anytime you cross a vector with itself, you get zero. And I'll just write it in vector form just to, just to make that make sense. Okay, does this make sense? Everybody with me so far on this? Okay, I'll, I'll assume you are. If you got any questions, let me know. Now, there's a lot of formulas here. There, there's a lot of stuff to remember. There's actually a really simple way to remember it that I'm going to use here in a second. What you do is you write your IJK sort of in order like a circle and you draw an arrow around it like that, like in alpha order. And if you follow that circle, your answer is positive. Like for instance, I cross with J is K, and because you followed the circle, it's positive. So what about like K cross with J? Well, K cross with J goes this way is I, but you're going opposite around the circle, so it's negative. This is just a simple way of of remembering all of this. Uh, I'm going to um, I'm going to hop back and forth or hop back to the slides because I want to sort of continue this derivation a bit. All right. Okay. So this slide, uh, this is what I'm saying. So uh, we tested out our definition on I, J, and K. And what we found were these six products in, in yellow on the top, but also the ones on the bottom say that anytime you cross a vector with itself, you get zero. Now, this is um, this little image that you see here on the bottom right. That's what I have drawn here. It's just a simple way of doing that. So Let's, let's talk about computing the cross product, okay? We know how to compute the cross product for i, j, and k, um, but that's fine. But what I really want is, is the cross product for, you know, an arbitrary vector, like, you know, some pile of x uh, or some, some force in the x direction times i, some force in the y direction times j, some force in the z direction times k. I want to compute the cross product for any arbitrary vector a and any arbitrary vector b. And so how do I do that? Well, the idea is that if I understand um, the cross product involving i, j, and k, then I understand the cross product involving any vector. Because what is any vector? Any vector is, and this is what the mathematicians would call a linear combination, any vector is just a linear combination of i, j, and k. So if you understand those, then you understand the whole thing. Now, what I got going on on this next slide is a lot, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take a, a, a second away from that. Okay, so let's, let's keep this on, on the board here, and let's, let's just do this like it would be any multiplication problem. So let's say I have some vector, and we'll just call it P, it doesn't matter, some vector P and some vector Q, okay? And so we'll say PXI plus PYJ plus PZQ. 
K. And then this is QXI plus QYJ plus QZK. And let's say I want to multiply these together. Okay. Well, we're going to do a, uh, 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 we're going to do this, you know, like we would any cross product. It's not P, or R, it's P. So P cross Q. So we're going to do this like we would do any multiplication. Let's go back to like basic algebra. Let me ask you a question. Like, how would you multiply this? Like, Go back to algebra. Like, how would you multiply this out? Well, you take the, you know, the x squared times this, and then the x squared times that, and then you take the 4x times this, the 4x times that, the 6 times this, the 6 times that, and you'd add everything together, right? That's how you would do this if it was a polynomial. We're going to do the same thing here. So it's going to be a bit long, but we're going to, uh, but I think you'll find it's not so bad. And so what we'll do is we'll, do the px terms, so we have this times this, this times this, this times this, so px qx, and then i, right? So px qx, and then that, because these are two i's, then that and that, so and then that and that, All right. You see what I'm doing? So I took this one, multiplied it by that, that, and that. Then I'll take this one, multiply it by that, that, and that. Now I'm running out of room on my board, so I'm going to add these below. And then these two. And then those two. And then this times this, this times this, this times this. I know that's a lot, but I mean, you'll never have to do this in class. It's just, uh, this is just for, for proof's sake. Okay. Um, and again, you, you could just follow along watching the video. Is everybody with me so far? Okay. All right. Now, what I want to do is I want to see if I can take this and I can make it simpler. Okay. Well, first off, let's see. We've got some I cross I's, J cross J's and k cross k's. I know those are zero, okay? So we can get rid of those. We can get rid of that. Get rid of that. Get rid of that. That makes our life a little easier. Just get rid of all the ones that are crossed with themselves. And then what I can do is I can use this mnemonic here to replace what's going on inside. Like for instance, i cross j, that's k. Okay, what about I cross J? That's going to be negative J. J cross I, that's negative K. J cross K, that's positive. That's going to be positive I. K cross I, positive J. And this is negative I. And we can say that's zero plus zero plus zero. So far, so good. And then what we do is we just start collecting all of our like terms. So all the stuff that's associated with the I vector. And so that's uh, this and this. So PY QZ minus PZ QY and then plus all the stuff compiled with the J vector plus all the stuff compiled with the K vector. And I, I'm going to, I'm not going to write all that out because we have it here on this slide.
and I want to make sure we're, we're using our time wisely. Okay, so what I have here on this slide is just me carrying all that multiplication out and then replacing all the terms with zeros and, and our unit vectors using that mnemonic that I came up with below uh, or came up with uh, earlier. Now, here's the thing. We still have a formula that's just like nuts. It's just huge. Like there's got to be a way to simplify this formula and make it easier to employ, right? And the answer is yes, okay? And the way that we uh, make this formula a lot easier is to use what's called the determinant, okay? Now, I'm not sure what your background is uh, in matrix algebra. Some of you are probably going to have a lot more experience with it than others. Um, but suffice it to say that the determinant is, is just a number that you use um, uh, that you use to describe a, a, a square matrix. Um, I propose, and, and, and we'll, we'll, I'll show you how to compute the determinant, but I propose that that yellow box that you see here on the bottom right, that if you use matrix algebra and you use the formula for the determinant, this formula ends up equaling this. And this is a whole heck of a lot easier to memorize than that. The only thing you got to ask is, well, how exactly do you compute the determinant? And I'm going to show you two different ways to do this. I'm going to skip um, this slide because this slide just shows you um, those, those two uh, methods in equation format. And instead of all these symbols and, 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 and whatnot, let's just do some problems, okay? So I have here two vectors. So we have vector A, which is uh, 2i plus j plus k, and then we have vector B, uh, which is uh, negative 4i plus 3j plus k. And the question is, what is the cross product? Now, I'm going to show you two different ways to do it. And there's actually, I guess, three different ways, because you could use this formula here on, um, I mean, you could use this and it would work, uh, but I want to try and avoid that formula and see if I can come up with a, a simpler way of doing it. Okay, so let me let me stop the share. So here's my uh, here's my my formula here. Here's my vector a and vector b. And so let me show you how you do this. So the first thing that you got to do is you got to set this up as the following. So a cross b equals. And what you do is you set up a three by three matrix. Okay. On the top row, you just put i, j, k. And then on the middle row, your first row, if you will, you put all the numbers associated with A. So two was at one and one. And then on the last row, you put all the numbers associated with B. All right. And then you're like, well, that's great, Dr. Mike, but how do I actually do it? How do I actually compute the cross product? Well, I'm going to show you two different ways to do it. And I, after today's lecture, I don't know that I'll care which way that you do it. Um, your calculator will probably do it too, but uh, it'll just give you a couple different uh, options to do it uh, in class. The first uh, option is called the rule of Saris. And this is a really simple way. I'm at, like, you're going to see this, you're going to think, God, that made all that stuff Dr. Mike just did a lot easier. All right, so here's the, how the rule of Saris works. So the first thing you do is you write this. Then what you do is you take these two columns and you repeat them over here. So we put the I one here, the J one here, two, one, minus four, three. You just repeat those next two columns over again until you have a grid that looks something like this. Then what you do is you start doing some multiplying, okay? And the way that you multiply this out is you start off by doing all of your products this way, okay? And you take those as positive, then you take your products this way and take them as negative. And so what do I mean by that? Well, we've got 
like a word search almost. That is I. What is that? That's J times one times negative four, so minus four J. And then this. K times two times three, so that's uh, plus six K. Minus, and then what you do is you do the products the other way. And I promise when it's all said and done, that that actually follows that same super long formula that we just derived. I mean, that formula was nuts. It was huge. And this pattern, if you can memorize this pattern, this pattern does the same thing. Okay, and so now what we're gonna do is we're gonna do the products the other way. So start off with that one. So J times two times one, that's two J and then three times one times I, that's three I, and then K times one times minus four. So minus four K. And then what you do is you just start collecting your like terms. So let's put all the stuff times I, all the stuff times J, all the stuff times K. And so what do we have times I? We have one minus three, one minus three. What about J? We've got negative four minus two, six, but then minus negative four, so plus four. And so A cross B, I propose is minus two I minus 6J plus 10K. Okay. I want to take a sec before we do the next one. I will or do this again using the, the, the other uh, pattern. But before we do this, I want to see if this makes sense and if there's any questions in the chat. Some of you might have done this before, depending upon where you're at in math. Some of you might have never seen this before. So, uh, so yeah, I want to give you all a second. <laughs> Your head hurts now. I I am I am sorry. I'm uh, uh, I ultimately my goal is to make it simple. And if the if this method is complicated, maybe the next one is a little simpler. The idea is to take a really big formula and to make it small. Or maybe another way of putting it is to make it a pattern, something that you can you know uh, uh, repeat. You know, the idea is, you know, you do your products this way, do your products that way, and boom. This vector is perpendicular to these two, and its magnitude is the area of the parallelogram formed by these two. And all you do is take the numbers this way, take the numbers that way, and, and subtract them. Tell you what. In the interest of time, I want to show you the next way of doing it. And, and the reason I'm giving you two ways to do it because this is probably new to you. And I'd kind of like you to uh, have a couple different ways to do it to check your answer. And so the other way we're going to do it is, is another way. It's called cofactor expansion. I don't know if one's harder than the other, but um, you'll see we end up getting the same answer. Okay. So let's let's talk about cofactor expansion. Okay. And again, if it makes you feel better, this is not on the exam next week, so you don't have to worry about that. Okay. So here's how cofactor expansion works. This is another way of doing the cross product and you get the same answer. So what you do is you take this 
and you split it up into smaller groups. So there's going to be a smaller one times I, a smaller one times J, and then a smaller one times K. And what you do is it's like positive, negative, positive. Okay. And so that's your pattern, positive, negative, positive. And how do you determine what goes inside here? Well, what you do is you basically say, okay, here's my matrix. Let's take the one that's associated with I. What I do is I cover up all the terms associated with I. And if I cover up this and cover up that, what am I left with? One, one, three, one. If I cover up all the terms associated with J, what am I left with? Cover up that, cover up that, what am I left with? I'm left with two minus four, one, one. If I cover up all the terms associated with K, two, one, minus four, three. Once I have these, what I got to do is I got to find the determinant of each of these smaller ones, but the determinant of those is really simple. Just all the products that way, all the products that way. So one times one is one minus that times that is three. Two times one is two. That times that minus negative four. This times this is six minus that times that minus four, and we get the same answer. Or, sorry, negative. I know this is probably a little strange. But that's the idea, is to give you two methods of, uh, of assessing it. Why is it negative? Oh, that's a good question. Um, without delving too much into linear algebra land, the idea comes from uh, the, the, the various permutations of, of, of pairs that you get. I don't, I don't want this to turn into a linear algebra uh, uh, lecture. But the idea is that if you follow the same pattern, so take this pattern up here where we crossed them that way and crossed them that way. If you rearrange that pattern in this fashion, then you get positive, negative, positive. So it's sort of like a checkerboard that like if this was, see how this is three by three? If it was like seven by seven, you'd do positive, negative, positive, negative, positive, negative, positive. So it's, it's, it's just because of the order by which that you do it. And again, in terms of the why, I mean, we can go into a linear algebra land, but it ultimately doesn't matter because you get the same answer. And, and, and just try what happens if you make that positive. This won't come out to the same answer uh, that you did before. I know this is a new topic, so I really want to make sure that this makes sense uh, for when you do your homework on Friday. So if there's any questions, I mean, please. While you all are chewing on this, I want to show you something. No, it will not. But we are going to start doing cross products uh, pretty quick after um, uh, after the, uh, the the first exam. Let me once this converts, I'll show you. Okay. So this is your homework that, that, to be clear, this is due next Friday. And all it is is just I want you to take these two vectors and basically, or these two problems and do this. The first one with the Saris rule and the second using cofactor expansion. Um, this might have been like a wild topic, like a math, you know, a heavy math lecture. But I promise you this homework will take you about 
like five or ten minutes if, if you're comfortable with this. I knocked out the solution, you know, in, in, in no time. I'm sitting here actually looking at the solution right now, and it, it's it's a pretty quick uh, uh, assignment. Um, and again, it's not you don't have to do it until after the exam, uh, so you you've got plenty of time on that. Um, are there any questions before we call it for today? All right, so let's just recap Monday. We're going to have exam review. So, uh, again, this topic won't be on the exam, but all the 2D, the 3D e uh, equilibrium, the resultants, all that stuff is going to be on the exam. So study your homeworks 1.1 to 2.7, all the notes from lecture 1 to lecture 10, and then come prepared to ask questions on Monday. Okay? Uh, that's all I have, everybody. We'll pick this cross product stuff up after the exam, and I think you're going to find it, it's not so bad. Um, once you do it, uh, once you repeat it and and do it over and over, it, it ends up uh, it ends up being pretty uh, uh, pretty straightforward. Uh, that's all I have, everybody. Y'all have a great weekend, and I will see you all on Monday.